guess if you uh, haven't already figured it out, tonight's overriding theme of freedom. And I can't help but think that uh, as an offering basket is passed, that's an area that a lot of us struggle. I know I did for a long time. And I believe that the whole reason for tonight's gathering is that God wants to release you from anything that controls you. And that's why we've gathered here tonight. Is freedom in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> well, um, started months ago, uh, just kind of walking through the book of Ephesians. And I've enjoyed it very much, and we're going to do that for a few more weeks. I don't know exactly how many, but we're going to walk through the book of Ephesians. And last week, we, as promised, we got to a section in Ephesians, and I wasn't going to dodge it. I wasn't going to jump over it. It was right there. It was all about marriage, and that's not, it's not easy, ladies, to hear that you're supposed to submit to your husbands in all things, is it? It's not easy. And, and husbands, it's not easy to, to, to lay down your life and give up what you want so that you can please your wife. It's not easy, is it? But that's what the Bible says. And if we're ever going to be that church that the book of Ephesians is written for, that, that, that church that's a faithful group of followers of Christ, not a, not a church that's, that's being rebuked for misbehaving, but a church that's doing well but could do better to be a more dynamic church, a more powerful church in their community. There's certain things we need to do. And, and part of that is, listen, ladies, you've got to submit to your husbands in all things as unto the Lord. It's not easy. And husbands need to, to lay down their life and love their wife like Christ loved the church. That's a cre an incredible watermark, isn't it, for us guys? That's tough. And we're supposed to wash them with the Word of God. Like what I do up here is supplemental, husbands. Listen up. It's supplemental to what you should be doing with your wife. And those are, those are, those are tough calls, but, but they're calls that need to be made if we're going to be a church that's powerful in our world. And I want to continue in our study through the book of Ephesians. And tonight we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. And I would ask you to please grab a copy of God's Word. If you don't already have one, uh, I hope that you do. I would encourage you all the time. Listen up, everyone. I would encourage you always to bring your Bible to church. Always bring your Bible, your Bible. Listen, these Bibles are here, and if you need one, take one and steal it. It's yours. It's your gift. But, but, but make a Bible your Bible so, so as God speaks to you with your Bible open, you can underline it, highlight it, make notes in the margins. That way you have a personal conversation with your Father, not just a generic one. So bring your Bible with you, but if you uh, don't have one, please grab a blue one and open it up to Ephesians uh, chapter 6. And if you have a digital Bible on a on a device, that's fine too. I prefer to hear pages turning. I want to. I just want to take a moment. I wasn't planning this, but I, I just feel like I should say this. Um, I. I. Who, who likes who likes making a good living? Who likes to, who likes to make a little bit, right? A little a little profit, right? I like it. <clears throat> I'm not going to ask you guys for any money. Ever, I'm not asking for any money, but you can pay me. You can, you, 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 can, you can give me a little something. A little something for the preacher. I, I want, and, and listen, and, and you might already be wanting to do this, but you didn't know you could. I, I just want to let you know that, that Revolution Church is, is a church where not only is it okay, but it's now, I'm going to tell you, it's encouraged that if God speaks to you, that you can let it be known. Amen! Hallelujah. Woo! Yeah, God. Go, Jesus. Whatever it is. Whatever swells up inside of you, please, please. That's my pay. I would, I would, I would, let me, let's try it. I'm going to say something and I'm just going to give you a chance to give, you, give Jesus an amen. You don't have to if you don't want to, but only if you're led, right? This is a, a simple one. God is good. I love that. That was great, right? You want to do it again? God is always good. Yes. That's the kind of church we need to be. 
Well, people walk into this place. We're new in town, right? We're the new church in town. They don't even know who we are. They see love in the name. They want to they see what love. They don't want it to be a name, right? They want to experience it. They want to walk into a room and they want to they see people that have some kind of interaction vertically with this God that they can't see. Because that's what they're looking for, right? They want something they can't find at work. And they need to find it here. So if you feel that swell, man, just let it out. Let it out. Let it out. All right? Permission granted. All right, so, so well, I want to tell you that one of, my, um, one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is in 2 Corinthians 5.17 where it says, If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has died, and behold, they can see a new man or a new woman. You can see someone new when you're in Christ. When you've bowed the knee to Jesus, you recognize your need for Him, and you've accepted His gift of eternal life, you are no longer the same person that you were. And listen, it doesn't make any difference if you grew up in, 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 in 2016, like right here, right now, or if you grew up in the 90s or the 80s, or you grew up in the 1800s or the 1300s, whatever the year, whatever the nation that you lived in, it doesn't make any difference what's going on around you. If you have said yes to Jesus, the old person is dead, and there's a new, literally a new creation started. It's new. It's new. But you know, as I was thinking about that this week, and I'm reading the text that we're going to read, which is Ephesians 6, starting verse 5. I'm going to read that in a few minutes. But as I was reading that, in my commitment to go through the text of Scripture with you, I get to that section, and I'm reading that, and it's talking about slavery. Well, we don't have, like, you know, slavery, like, in the, in the, in the, in the true sense, like, slaves here in this country anymore. This book's 2,000 years old. And I started thinking about that. Like, you know, people are going to read this and they're going to think, well, this isn't appropriate right now. And how could God condone slavery? And, and I started thinking as I'm doing that, and I, and I hope that you'll do this too when you read your Bible, is that you, you slow down and let the Bible speak to you. And, and, and I did that. And, and I started thinking about how the culture, like just our, how much it's changed. Like I'm only 47 years old, right? But, but just... This is 2,000 years old. And, and listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use Granny as an example. I, I, she's the oldest person in this room, right? In September, she will be 90, right? Okay? Not a spring chicken, would you agree? Like, not brand new. She's not brand new, right? But think about that. To us, that's a long time. But to her, how long did that go? Wicked fast, right? Real fast. 90 years is a blink. But just in her life, just think about just in her in one generation, how much has changed. You know, I was driving down the road the other day, and, and, and I was, uh, we had gone down to, to Sarasota to see Kyle and Jamie. I'm driving back in, in my wife's minivan, little Pontiac, Montana. I think it's a 2000. Things has been in a severe wreck. The windows don't go up and down. You know, it's got bad suspension. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's got 100,000. You know, it's nothing. It's just a little junker, right, in, the, in today's world. But I'm driving down 75, and I start thinking about this car. Like, as junky as it is, can you imagine? I was going down through this corner in, on 75, going about 65 or so, and it was fairly smooth and got air conditioning, captain seats. Power windows that don't work, but I got power windows. Cruise control. And I started thinking about, man, can you imagine if I had this car, which is kind of junky, back when they started making cars? I would have been a, like an all-star. They would have looked at me like, wow, what, how, listen how quiet it is. They didn't, you know, they didn't have wheels that are like this. I got tires on it, man, and I can corner, and it's comfortable, and I got AC, and I got a, a radio that's playing music and stuff. Like, can you imagine the change just in that? How about computers? I don't think you've still, you still haven't even used a computer, have you? Probably not. No. Listen, spaceships and people walking on the moon. That's freaky, right? The internet. All the information at your fingertips. 
You can FaceTime someone. I FaceTime my sister in Massachusetts and see her baby while I'm sitting in my living room. Remember, who used to, listen, right here, look, who's got one of these? That's the most powerful tool in the universe right now. Everyone's got one. All that information at your disposal. You can sit in your living room and you can, you can be George Jetson or James Bond in your living room and you can look at someone and they're in Boston and you can talk. I was, I was Facebooking back and forth with a dude in, in Africa. It's crazy how much the world has changed in just a short generation. But I gotta tell you something, and, I, and listen, I, I want you to be comforted by this, is that no matter what culture you're in, no matter what time you're living in, God's priorities have never changed when pop culture shifts. Never, ever changes. I found this quote from A.W. Tozer, it should be up on the screen, if you could, please. Thank you. This is a lie, this is awesome, this guy's brilliant. A lie doesn't become truth, wrong doesn't become right, and evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by a majority. Amen. And that's the air that we breathe right now in our, in our world, in the culture that we live in. When pop culture back in the 70s was announcing to everyone, free love, just make love, don't make war, just, just make love to whoever, it feels good. That's what they announced, but God's position on purity and holiness and sexual immorality never changed. In the 1700s, when, when the 1700s came along and the Enlightenment movement exploded all over Europe, promoting diverse philosophies that placed man and reason at the center of the universe and put the church and everything we stood for and the Word of God on the back burner in our culture, God's word back in Psalm 2, verses 3 and 4, still said, quote, let us free ourselves from slavery to God, but the one who rules in heaven laughs. When people try to put him on the back burner, and it makes him giggle. And in our world right now, where abortion is killing millions and millions of unborn children, and we've removed prayer from schools, and homosexuality is so rampant that even now, when, when the Bible says that those who practice sexual immorality and homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God, it said it 2,000 years ago, it says it today, but if you say it today, it's hate talk. Our world has changed, hasn't it? But God's word says of itself, that it does not change, that heaven and earth will melt away, but the word of God will stand forever. It does not change based on the cultural shifts. And God wrote a book, and unlike the Constitution, which we hold at very high regard, and we should, but the Constitution that can be amended at the whim of a culture shift, the word of God cannot be amended, it never will be. It never changes, it never changes. God's word does not change. Can you turn me down just a hair, please? Now, that being said, God's word doesn't change, but it always speaks to a changing, an ever-changing culture. No matter where you are, and no matter what year you live, that may change, but God's word speaks to that all the time. It never, ever changes. And it offers the ever-changing culture that's presented to it a, a, a different culture, if you will. A culture is just the way we think and operate as a, as a family in, a, in an area. That's what we do. That's our culture. And the, and the Bible, God's Word, teaches a different culture, a different set of ideals and a different set of standards and a different set of ways. It's what Jesus Christ meant in John 17. I would welcome you to please uh, keep your finger in Ephesians 6, but look at John 17, if you will, and hear the word of God as spoken directly out of Jesus Christ's mouth, where he says in verse 14, the world hates them. He's speaking, Jesus is speaking about you, his disciples. If you bend your knee to Christ, and become a disciple of Jesus, he's speaking about you. 
And he's speaking to his Father in heaven about you. And he says the world hates them because they do not belong to this world. Just as I do not belong to the world. He goes on in verse 15. He says, I'm not asking you, Father, to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. What he's saying here is that you live here on this globe, but the globe has a system that it's operating under, which is the system of the enemy of your soul, and it's a system that is designed to steal, kill, and destroy. And he says, listen, when you have bent your knee to Christ, you only have one master, and it's not the system of this world or the one who oversees it. It's Jesus Christ who's your only master. So even though you're in the world, like we all know, you guys know that you live here, right? Some of you grew up in the 70s, you might not realize that. But you're here right now. That's a news flash. But, but just because you're here, that doesn't mean that you have to be a product of the system that runs this world. In other words, G- Father, don't, don't remove them from the earth. Just keep them here, but protect them from this demonic system that's designed to kill them. So keep them here, but use them for good. Give them a new master. Give them a new way to live. So even though we live here, what we see and what we hear and what we touch, in other words, what we experience as a whole isn't, or should I say, doesn't have to be your reality. And he's offering you something different in God's word. And that brings us to Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm going to read it with you, starting in verse 5. If you're there, holler. You are there? Okay. It says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching you. As slaves of Christ... Do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. So the question is, is this appropriate for now? Because we don't have slavery in this country. Slavery is illegal here now. Praise God. That's a good place for an amen. Amen. Okay, you're free to do that. Okay, it's illegal here, but it wasn't illegal then. It was a widely accepted way to live. And we know that it's despicable and wrong, and it flies in the face of what God said in the beginning, the Imago Dei. All of us people, were, we were created in God's image to be like Him. So that means we have value and worth, every person. So no one is above anyone else, and no one is below anyone else. And to, to melt a person's life down to a piece of material to be owned or gained, property, uh-uh. It's wrong. But it was okay then. And so, he's God's speaking to that culture at that moment. But at the same time, I told you, right? His word never changes. He's speaking to us right here, right now. It still applies. Let me start to unwrap this for you. Let me just start by saying that many people, many good church folks, they see social injustice as the zenith of Christianity. They see a need and they want to attack it. Got to feed people. Got to clothe them. Got to house them. Got to stop abortion. Got to do this. Got to do that. Listen. Awesome. Christians should engage there. Amen? Amen? If you see a need. The Bible says that when Jesus came to Jerusalem, he looked at the people, he began to weep, and he was moved with compassion. That means he actually got off his rump and did something to help them. He didn't just go, man, I feel bad for them. I'll pray for you. Because that's what we do. So we're supposed to engage. But that's not the pinnacle of Christian, uh, of Christian uh, existence. That caused this incredible outburst of the parachurch 
organizations in the 80s and 90s. The parachurch organizations are good organizations that there was a group of people in the body of Christ and they would read the scriptures and they saw a need, a felt need in the world and they were like, you know what? This is everything to me and I believe that we need to, to, to go to Africa and we need to dig wells for the people because they're, they're, they're dying. They need, they need water so we get all resources right to... That's awesome. And that's what started the parachurch organization. And so they do this one thing and they do it real well and they funnel all their resources to it. But that's not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is diverse. The body of Christ includes all of us that have different passions and different talents and different goals. And we read the, the Bible and we see different things. We're not all called to the same thing, are we? But we're called to engage but that's not the pinnacle. That's not the, ze the zenith of Christianity. The pinnacle is this, and it always has been. It's for God's Spirit to invade the deepest chambers of a person's heart and to change their reality, to change who they are, to change their identity, change their words, change their thoughts, change their perspective, change their priorities, change their, their attitude, change their schedule, change everything on the inside. On the inside. That's what God's goal is. That's His goal right now. That's why you're sitting here. To change your reality. That's why the Bible says we live by faith and not by sight, right? It's not always what we see. It's not all this stuff out here where we can feel and touch and, and, and hear and all that stuff. It's what's going on inside of here that matters. That's, that's the target that, that God is going for. It says that God's perfect love expels all fear. You know, when that love expels the fear, when it finally hits your heart, that's when it expels. He's not out to expel fear. He's out, he's out to hit the center of your heart. That's what he wants to do. That's what he wants to do. And it's God's Word that proclaims and explains this new reality. And it's God's Spirit that empowers the believer to live what we read in Scripture. Working together to cause change inside of a person. Now I'm going to tell you something before people would jump to the conclusion and say, well, God is condoning slavery. I've heard so many people that just, they never even read the whole Bible. They just like pick out little pieces and they, they'll read this and they go, oh, God's condoning slavery. What kind of a God would do that? <laughs> He's not. He's not condoning slavery. As a matter of fact, I can tell you right now, and I'm, I, I think you probably all agree with me, that God does not like slavery. I'm just going to give you one example. Maybe you've heard of it. The Exodus. <laughs> you know, his people are in slavery and God's like, uh-uh. And he gets them out, right? So, so don't we know his heart when it comes to slavery? He doesn't like slavery. He's created us all in his image to be like him. So no one should be treated like a piece of material, a piece of property. And, and so when you read this right here, he, he's not necessarily trying to end slavery in a physical sense, kind of is, but he's trying to, to, to destroy slavery at an emotional, mental, spiritual level. Do, do you see it there? He wasn't trying to get rid of slavery. Like He didn't go to the taskmaster and say, listen, dude, you need to release her right now. Like he didn't do that. He could, could he have done that? All in favor? Yeah, he could have done that. But he didn't, right? But he's speaking to people, and when he changes their perspective, he changes the attitude, and slavery dies. You see? And that's what he's trying to do. When the slave's perspective changes, so will his attitude. So let's talk about slavery for a second. And it could be either physical slavery, or it could be slavery to something else. What, what, I don't know how else to, to, to frame this other than what, why does slavery suck? I, I jotted some reasons down why slavery is, is terrible. How about lack of reward, right? You have to work all day in the fields or in the farm or whatever, and you work all day in the sweat and the heat and, and the sun and, or in the rain or the snow, whatever it is, and you don't get pay. You're owned. There's no, there's no payback, right? So that's not very rewarding. No respect. 
right? You're, you're thought of as a, as a piece of material, something to be owned, something to be whipped and beaten like, a, like an ox or a cow or something or a donkey. At that level, no respect, uh, no control. You have no control over your life, do you? You're a ta- you have a taskmaster, and he, and he or she tells you what you can and cannot do. You have no ability to make your own choices. You have zero control over your own life. I jotted this down, no status. If you're a slave in a culture that allows slavery, how do people view you? Probably not real high. The people that are not slaves, the elite, the, 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 the powerful people, the wealthy people, the educated people, they don't look at slaves with any type of status. They're, they're low-lying people, aren't they? Not much fun. How about this? No purpose. Well, what are, you, what are you waking up for every day? What are you trying to accomplish other than to, to do a ton of work for someone else and you get nothing back for it? C- can you imagine if you had to wake up every single day and you had to go to work all day, work 40, 50 hours a week, and, and it was not going to be for your gain at all. You couldn't receive anything from it. How many people would be up for that? I didn't think a lot of hands would go up. And that's what a slave lives like. How about this? No fulfillment. Same thing, you wake up every day, you, you give your whole life, you're working like a dog, and you feel like, I'm getting nowhere. Does anyone ever feel that way? Yeah. And listen, you're not a slave like this was. You you don't have an evil taskmaster literally whipping you like we had in this country a long time ago. It wasn't that long, was it? And and, and back in Egypt, we don't have that anymore. That doesn't mean you're not a slave. Let me tell you something. There's a powerful word in, in what I'm about to tell you. When you choose, that's the word right there. One of my favorite words. When you choose, Bible says, I place before you blessings and curses, life and death, death. Now choose life. He says, today, choose whom you will serve. There's a lot of power in choices. And God, who is the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things, the end all of all things, it says that Jesus has been given, got authority in all of heaven and all of earth. He is the boss. And he said, you have the power to choose who your taskmaster will be. And so when you choose, listen, when you choose by, the, by your own will, when you choose to work sincerely and enthusiastically like the Bible says here in Ephesians 6, when you choose to work enthusiastically and sincerely, not by the force, the strong arm of another, but, but, but by the will of your own, you are free. You're free. And that's exactly what he's talking about right here. He didn't tell the person, taskmaster, get rid of your slaves. He told the slave to check your attitude. And if you change your perspective on things and you choose to serve that taskmaster like he is Jesus Christ because you love Jesus, you don't love your taskmaster, do you? You you do it because he's whipping you and beating you and telling you you have to do it. But, But when you love Jesus, then your will is just acting in obedience to the love that he's shown you. And when you're going to work every day, even for an evil taskmaster, with that as your attitude, every, different game, right? Yeah. Totally different game. And that's what he's talking about here. You've got to change your perspective on things. Change your perspective. It's not being released from the physical of slavery that God is after here. He's, he's after what's going on inside of you. And he can release you, even if you don't have a physical taskmaster. If something owns you, instead of you owning it, God wants to break that chain in your life. And it says that the the, the kingdom of, of men, let me tell you something, the kingdom of men is what you see. That's what you see. When you see a taskmaster, he has he has developed and built a kingdom of his own. And he is lording over you. And he's whipping and beating you. That's the kingdom of men. But the kingdom of God is quite different. In Luke 17, Jesus tells us that the kingdom of God is within. It's here. 
And that's why the text here, when it says, at the end of it, it says it doesn't matter if you're slave or free. Because it's what's happening inside of you that matters. Whether you're literally a slave to an evil taskmaster, or you're a free man or free woman, and you don't have an evil taskmaster, it doesn't make any difference what you see. That's all that matters is what's in here. That's what God's working on. We see it in uh, Paul. Paul, Paul was, he's my hero. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you know, he's talking about marriage. And I'm, that's not a good time for husbands to yell out, amen, about an evil taskmaster. The single guys will remain single. Um, <laughs> so, so he's talking about marriage. And you can read that. I recommend that you read that. He's talking about when you should be married, when you shouldn't, how to conduct yourself in marriage, and whether you should be single, whether you should be married. Get it, get it, get it, get it. But the principle applies, and he talks about this in, in 1 Corinthians 7.32. He just says this, and it's so true and apropos for us tonight. He just says, I want you to be free from the concerns of this world. That's what God wants to do. He doesn't want you to be the slave of anything in this world. That you have only one master, and his name is Jesus Christ. All of us at some point and at some level experience slavery to some type of situation, some type of relationship. Perhaps it's a job that you have that you feel like you're in jail. You can't get out. It decides your schedule. It decides your priorities. Maybe it's financial lack and you're, you're starving to death so you want to work, 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 work more. Or maybe it changes your mentality because of your lack. You feel like a pauper rather than a prince. You, you're just saying that you, I am a child of God, right? So that's the reality because that's what the Bible says is a reality. But yet, even though you sing it, you act like you're a bum on the street because you lack. And, and so you can have nothing in your bank account and still live with joy because you're a child of the king. You don't need to be rich. See, that's the kingdom of men. The kingdom of men has people being wealthy with opulence and they own Caesar's palace and you need this to be happy and you have to have this kind of car and you have to have that kind of house and you have to have that kind of job and that status and this and that to be happy. And God's like, no, 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 no. You're my kid. I'm the king. You have a priceless inheritance in heaven and you can enjoy it right now. He's placed you in the heavens next to Christ right now. You don't have to wait. You're a prince. You're a princess. You're a princess. Anyone? This is Princess Paula right here. Hi, Princess Paula. She's a princess. Every little girl wants to be a princess, right? Don't they all want to be princess? My little girl, she, lo she loves Disney princess. She wants to be a princess. They're not even real princesses, but she is. That's awesome. I think, I think Rapunzel would probably have a Jameson doll if she only knew. Maybe she'd have a Paula doll. She'd have a Miss Paula doll. These things that, that we have in our life, our situations, our relationships, our jobs, our financial lack. How about, how about debt? You don't have to raise your hand if you have debt. Credit cards and mortgages and houses and stuff like that. But that stuff owns people. So every time you go to the mall and you put something on your credit card, you think you bought it and that you own it, I got news for you. You ready? It owns you. It owns you. And, and when, you, when you build up such debt that it dictates everything you're thinking, like, hey, honey, can we go out to do this this weekend? I'd like to go visit my sister in, you know, wherever. Uh, I can't. Why? Because my debt is choking me to death and I need to work. So I, it's not that I get to work because I love my vocation, right? And I get to make a little bit so I can provide for my family and make a little bit so I can be generous and give to others in need and build the kingdom of God and all that kind of stuff. No, I have to work because I'm up to my eyeballs in Taskmaster, I mean MasterCard. That's slavery, right? And these things dictate who we are and how we think and unfortunately, they give us our identity. 
and they dictate our emotions, and they dictate our choices, and they dictate our mood. Who's in a good mood when you're totally broke and you have to work because you have to make a minimum payment on a credit card? That sucks. Right? What in the world is that? Is that what that is? Someone's got some thump. I hope he didn't put that on MasterCard. <laughs> so, so the Bible says, this is, this is awesome, ready? The Bible says that whoever, you're, you're a slave to whoever you choose to obey. See, some people, some people are taskmasters and they overrule. They, they come and they take you and they make you a slave by force. Like they'll come with a gun, they'll come with a whip, right? Those guys are wicked. But sometimes that happens, and if you look past, back in history, that's happened, right? Egypt, here in America, all over the place, we've seen that. But there's another type of slavery. The other type of slavery is who you choose to let you, you giving them permission, here, just be my taskmaster. Isn't that stupid? That's kind of dumb, isn't it? And that's exactly what we do all the time. We let the things of this world, we give them permission to dictate who we are, how we think, our perspective, our priorities, our schedule, our mood, our choices, everything. It's all run by my authority given over to you. That is stupid. That is stupid. And we should stop doing that. But listen to this. I'm going to read it again. You are a slave to what you choose to obey. Now that's a statement in Scripture. And I want to ask you something. In that truth statement, where does the power lie? What is the power lie in the statement that you are a slave to what you choose to obey? What is the power? Your choice, right? It's, 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 it's your choice. Ultimately, it's in you. Again, Jesus has been given authority in heaven and on earth, and that same Jesus told you right now, right now tonight, July 2nd, 2016, to Revolution Church, he has given you the authority to decide who will be your master. The power is in your pocket. And if you give it up to someone or something else, you're a fool. So we read a book, some of us around here, and it's, it's this. Be a powerful person. Don't give that control to someone or something else. Jesus gave it to you. Don't give it up to a spouse, a kid, a job, a country, an economy, a car, a house, a debt, a bill, a dream, nothing. You own it. God gave it to you. It's your inheritance. As a prince or a princess, don't let it go. Whatever you choose to obey, you become a slave to it. And current conditions don't have to dictate your life. <clears throat> I'm going to take you back a little. This was, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe a year and a half ago. Take this well, I hope you will. <clears throat> but a year and a half ago, I walked up onto the stage at the chapel to, to preach. And, and a man, Moses Robbins, who... I mean, I, I'm a pretty bold guy. Like, I'm not afraid of any of you. I don't, I mean, physically I am. I know that some guys in this room would absolutely take me like that. I get it. But I'm not afraid of you. I don't particularly care what anyone thinks. I know that when I was saved some 14 years ago, I know that God said, go tell people about me. Right here. Just go do this. Like, I know that. So I started to. And I would preach boldly. Like, whatever it says, I would say it. I didn't care what anyone thought. I didn't care what anyone said. And it went well. And our church began to grow. Well, I started to do what I shouldn't do, which is I started to listen to everybody. Because, you know, everyone will tell you that the church is all about the people and, and relationships and all that. And, and, and it is important, but it's, a, it's, it's of secondary importance to what God tells you to do. You have one master, it says, right? Whatever you choose to obey becomes your master. And I allowed the people that I know and love, and some that aren't even here anymore, 
not quite sure how much they loved me, but I started to let them tell me what I should do. You, you talk too loud, you talk too quiet. You talk too long, you talk too short. You, 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 listen, you, you, should, you should preach about this topic and you should preach about that topic and the church needs to hear more about this and why don't you preach about that and, and it should be a little bit more about grace. And No, but you've got to be telling the truth and you've got to talk about the law and we should take communion every week and why do we not do it enough and the music's too loud and the this and that. And, and I got up on that stage that night, I remember it as clear as yesterday, and I stood up there and the music ended and I walked up I used to walk on the floor, if you all remember. I got up there. This is what I was doing. I was thinking paralyzed. I couldn't even talk. I, I was listening to so many masters that I literally didn't even know what to say. I was afraid to pull the trigger on God's word because I didn't want to upset the people that were part of the church. You know, I didn't want it to fail so bad. I wanted to please everyone so bad that I did whatever. But the problem was, is that you told me, no, you didn't really, but I'm just using you. You told me to speak longer, and you told me to speak shorter, and you told me to speak about the law, and you told me to preach grace, and you told me this, and you told me that. And I'm like, what, 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 what do I, I don't know what to do. I was paralyzed. And one day I was at the church, it was on a Monday, we used to do Mondays, we'd fast and pray all day. And I was sitting there with some of the guys. And all of a sudden it dawned on me. Because the scripture says, you, you know, be, be strong and courageous, for I am with you. And I am the lifter of your head. I was like, pardon me, but what the hell am I scared of them for? Seriously, what, why, why, I fear God. I fear God alone. What could man do to me? Like, I needed him to tell me this. So, so, and and I, felt, I felt like, you want to talk about breaking every chain? Like, you could hear the chain hit the floor that day. I mean, crash. And I was free. And, and now, I, like, I, I don't care what anybody thinks. It doesn't make a difference. Because let me tell you something. I love you, but I will never look into the piercing eyes of Mike Schmidt in heaven and give an account for my life. I will never look into the eyes of my beautiful wife who I love more than anyone on this earth and have to give an account for what I did with my life. I will never look in the eyes of my kids. I will never look in any of your eyes. I will never look in the eyes of the president, the company I would work for, nothing. I will look into the piercing eyes of the one to whom I must give an account. And he said, preach his word until you're done. And that's what I do. <clears throat> so... That's a good example of what I'm talking about. But my example, it pales in comparison to the, I think, the greatest example. The greatest example is always, I'm always going to bring you back to God's word. Always back to God's word. That's what I was supposed to do. And I'm going to just tell you that there's one man that the gospel so invaded him that he was able to not only understand this concept of one master and one master only, but he was able to, to embrace it, understand it, to teach it clearly, and to completely live it out. He understood this reality, and it was the Apostle Paul. This guy was amazing. And listen, I want to I read some, some out of 2 Corinthians chapter 6 with you. I, please, please put your eyes on God's Word. Don't just you know, blatantly trust me because I have a microphone on, okay? Put God's word in front of your face and, and read it. This is, this is not just uh, descriptive text that just tells you how awesome Paul was. Like, we all can agree he was an awesome guy. But the reason why he was an awesome guy is because he literally, what, what, what we've been preaching since this church started years ago was this, open it, read it, and do it. And he did that. He did what Jesus told him to do, period. That's what made him great. And he welcomes you to do the same thing. He welcomes you to be free from any type of slavery, anything that controls you, re get released from it, and live only for me. And so we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, um, I'm trying to, let me see if I can find out where, where it started. I didn't jot it down in my notes. I just wrote it down. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6. Verse 4. 
In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God, and he tells us why. We patiently endure troubles and calamities and hardships of every kind. I love that word, patiently. What, what, why, why is it, God's words chosen perfectly and carefully? Why does it say patiently? Because when you're in a storm and things aren't so good, you're not supposed to be freaking out! You're supposed to trust, right? Trust that God is with you in that storm, in that hardship, in that calamity, in that trouble. He waits patiently, enduring it, like he's dealing with it calmly, cool, collected, knowing that God will deliver. See, that's the attitude he wants for us. Remember, the kingdom of God is within it's not what you see, it's what's going on inside of you. And that's what he's trying to build into you right here tonight. He says, we've been beaten, imprisoned, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion. Listen, let me tell you something, Christians. We need a dose of this. We, we need, as Christians, we need to be happy about going to bed exhausted at night for the work of the kingdom of God. We need to be able to wake up in the morning and go to bed late and work and work diligently to build the kingdom of God. And that doesn't mean just coming here and building walls. That means you work all day to make a living for your family, to make a living so you could go and help other people financially, but then you come home and you get down on the floor and you play with your kids even if you work 15 hours. That means that you, part of building the kingdom of God, we read this last week, is, is to lay down your life for your wife. I'm exhausted, honey. I worked all day. Yeah, tough. Tough it out and go take your wife out for dinner. Go massage her feet. Go help her. Go watch a movie with her. Spend time with her. Let her have a break from the kids. You're tough guys, right? So be tough and help your wife. That's part of building the kingdom of God. And we need to be able to, like he said here, you need to be able to work to exhaustion. I'm tired. I'm so tired. You think Paul was tired? I can't remember where it says it, but it says that he was the example of working hard with his hands, not only to provide for himself, to provide for everyone that traveled along with him. And then he went to the lecture hall of Tyrannus every day for over two years and preached all night. Guy was awesome, an awesome example, but not so we could praise him, it's so we could be like him. Remember what he said? Follow me as I follow Christ. Do as I do. And that's what he did. We've been beaten, imprisoned, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights. I'm so tired. And gone without food. We've been beaten, but not killed. Our hearts ache, but we have joy. Come on, there's an amen spot right there. Come on now. Right? We are poor, but have spiritual riches that we give others. And there's a good one for us. Ready? We own nothing. Yet we have everything. Amen. I hear it said that if you have everything and don't have Jesus, you have nothing. And if you have Jesus and don't have anything else, you have everything. Amen. And it's true. And it's true. Paul, listen, this is awesome, right? You got to jot this down. Paul cannot be imprisoned even if he's physically in jail. Amen. That's awesome. You can't put that guy in jail. No matter what you do, he's got joy. He's happy. He doesn't matter if you, if you feed him, if you whip him, if you beat him, if he's shipwrecked. He, he finally gets, he gets shipwrecked. He finally gets to shore and he gets bitten by a snake. Come on. And he didn't care. He's like, no matter what I have, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I have a ton of food or I have no food, if I'm rich or if I'm poor, it's all good. It doesn't make any difference. The Lordship of Christ in Paul's life freed him from all current conditions. And the Bible tells us that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead and the same Spirit that empowered Paul also lives in you if you believe. So it's a descriptive text and a prescriptive text. It's not just what Paul did, but it's the same Spirit that lives in you. And you have the power to do the same. The Lord so changed Paul's perspective that, he, that Paul says this in Philippians 1.21. He says, 
To live is Christ, but to die is gain. He's like, I, I realize that if I'm drawing another breath, it's for the glory of God, for the service of God, for the worship of God, for the glory of God. Everything I say, everything I think, everything I do, every song I sing, everything, every person I run into, my very life is here to glorify God, to spread the kingdom of God, to lead people to Christ. They put him in jail. He's like, that's cool. It's actually good for you guys if I'm in jail. And I'll lead all the jail guards to Christ. Try to put me in jail. And he's like, you know what, if it's so bad that not only they put me in jail, but if they kill me, woo, I get to go be with Jesus. So if I'm here, I get to serve him. And if I'm dead, I get to hang out with him. Put me in jail. He didn't care what happened. What do you do with a man like that? I ask you, Daisy, what do you do with a woman like that? What could you do to a man like that who had that attitude that no matter what happened to him, live or die, good job, bad job, great marriage, bad marriage, good kids, bad kids, great country, bad country goes under, doesn't make any difference. What happens? I'm good in Christ. That's awesome, right? That's awesome. That's what the church is all about. It changed his life and nothing could stop him. And Revolution Church, right? We're supposed to follow in the footsteps of Christ and the apostles to offer the world a new way to live. Revolution is a shift in the status quo, right? That's what a revolution is, a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. And can you imagine if this church became a group of people that didn't give a rip about what they saw in front of them? That, that you were in a job that, that, that the guy next to you or the girl next to you were doing the same exact thing that you did and they hated it and they were miserable and grumpy and you walked around that place whistling Dixie all day long, happy as could be. They'd be like, what is wrong with you? And you say, well, let me tell you what's right with me. What would happen if they walked in here and they met a bunch of people that had the joy of the Lord just pouring out of the, the pores of their skin. And, and, and let, no, listen, no one in here, I know all of you, no one in here is rich. No one. At best, we're making it. Now, with a group of just making it people, if they walked into, into a, listen, if you walk into a bar where there's a bunch of people that are just making it, what's the overall attitude in there? Ho-hum. Boom. That's why they're in there drinking trying to escape reality. How about walking into a church with the same group of people, but instead of being drunk on beer, you're drunk on the Holy Spirit, and you're so happy you don't care what's going on. Wouldn't that, would that, that, where else in this world can you experience something like that? And that's what he's talking about. He wants you released from the things that bind you, that control who you are. And so the practical thing is, here's, here's the practical. What's got you enslaved? What, what is it, what current situation or circumstance, uh, relationship, a job, a car, money, the desire to acquire more? The Bible says if riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. Maybe it's lack of money. Maybe it's debt that's controlling what you do with your time and your money and your thoughts. Maybe it's the geography. Maybe it's where you live. Maybe it's your health. Man, I say that all the time. People that have a health condition, you walk up to them, you talk to them, and the first thing out of their mouth every single time is to tell you about their ailment. Saved people. People that are going to be in glory forever for, for, for 100 million years my back. So it's always the same thing if someone, listen, I have seen, I have seen people that have everything, like every, tons of money and beautiful homes and great jobs and everyone's healthy and everything, and they walk around miserable. See them? I've also known stage four cancer victims with smiles on their face. And guess what? It's a choice. It's a choice. 
You know none of you are getting out of here alive, right? We're all going to die. We're all going to die. We're part of a, 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 an all-inclusive club. Everyone's going to die. But, but, but when you die outside of Christ, that's scary. It should scare you. But if you die in Christ, you don't die. You might rest for a little bit, but you don't die. Doesn't that, just, just hearing that spoken over you, doesn't that just change your perspective? Right now, it's a perspective change. That if the worst thing that could happen to you right now is that you could be persecuted for your faith and put on a cross, Death, where's your sting? Go to hell, death, right? So what could possibly bother you? Man, I'm just saying, what, what if we could be that church? What if we could be that church with that, a group of people with that kind of attitude? What are you choosing to obey over God? What, 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 what is dictating your identity? When someone introduces himself to you, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you respond to them? Is it your health? Is it your profession? Is it your favorite sports team? Is it your spouse, your kids, even your church? Is that, what's the first thing that pops into your head? And I'm not, I haven't graduated here, but if it's not God and I'm a prince, I'm off. I'm off, because that's your identity. You are a child of God. Amen. And, and that's it. He's your only master. The old has died. Behold, the new man. This is a critical issue in the church because it's truly a matter of lordship. You can't call Jesus Christ Lord and Savior if he's not your Lord. And there's zero, do this for me, go like this, zero, right? There's zero room in the throne room of your heart other than Jesus. He will not share his throne with another. And if he is truly the Lord of your life, then he is the only anything that sits on the throne of your heart. Nothing else can dictate who you are, what you think, what you say, anything. Your perspectives, your priorities, your agenda, your wallet, anything. Nothing can dictate your life except Jesus Christ. And so you have to think about this. This is the time to do something about it. This is the time to respond. You've heard the word of God proclaimed to you. And now it is the responsibility of yours to respond. He said, if you move close to me, I move close to you. You came close to him in worship. He moved to you on the cross and in his word right now. Will you respond? And so now is the question, what are you choosing to obey? What is it that dictates your life? Is it your bank account? Is it your job? Is it your family? Is it your health? Or is it Jesus Christ? You've got to think about this. And I encourage you to really think deeply about this. Meditate on this. Don't just go, hey, preach, that's a good message. That's good, that's true. No, no. I don't want to hear any accolades. I don't want to hear any praise. I want to see results. And God wants to see results. He wants to see change in people. In Ephesians 1.13, it says that when you believed, there was a moment in time that you believed the gospel. And it said that at that moment, he placed his Holy Spirit in you. In you. Okay? In you. And in 2 Corinthians 3.17, it says where the Spirit of the Lord is. Now, if, if he placed it in you, raise your hand to show me if it's in you. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you, right? Okay. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. There is freedom. And so it's a choice. Are you going to be free to serve Christ? 
or are you going to be in bondage to serve anything else? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom to choose who or what will be your master. And so in closing, let me remind you that the reward in slavery, like I said earlier, is very low. There's not much reward in slavery. You don't get much pay. There's not a whole lot of purpose. There's virtually no pleasure. There's zero control over your life and over your identity. There's no respect from anybody. There's very low status. But I want to close by telling you this, that in our text that we read, God makes a promise. And we know His promises can be believed and received when we look at the cross. He promised He would come and save you. And He did on the cross at Calvary. And so when God makes a promise, you can believe it. And God makes a promise in verse 8. That if you will be a slave to Him, and you will work diligently, enthusiastically, even in the worst of situations, as unto Him, it says, remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good that we do, whether we are slaves or we are free.